thank you very much. Um, thank you for giving up your Saturdays. I hope you enjoy it. Enjoy it. Um, this is the Joseph Black building where I live, but I work, but sometimes it feels like this. <laughs> and if you step outside, you'll see some glassware that Joseph Black used when he was discovering carbon dioxide or doing research into it. So uh, this is really the home of carbon dioxide. And this is what I want to talk to you about. This is uh, one of my favorite diagrams. This is, of course, the periodic table. And this is what chemists adore, and this is something you memorize for fun. Uh, well, I certainly did. And the bit that I particularly enjoyed memorizing was the F block. So these are the footnotes of the periodic table at the bottom. They're large, uh, some of them are radioactive, um, and they're stuffed full like pomegranates of neutrons and electrons, which makes it very difficult to do theoretical <coughs> calculations on how they behave, um, which means that experimental work to do make compounds to understand them is particularly important, and particularly also important for metals such as this. This is uranium, and I'm going to talk to you a lot about uranium chemistry today. So we make molecules, we try to make things that people wouldn't think possible to exist, things that the textbooks would tell you can't be made. And by doing that, we get a fundamental understanding of how the bond <coughs> behaves, and from that we can learn more about how to deal with these important metals. So this is the most important thing that you probably know about uranium. This is the 235 isotope of uranium. And what's special about this nucleus is that when you hit it with a neutron, it breaks up into fission products. And it gives out a lot of energy and some neutrons. So this is carbon-free energy, and I think we all know about this. And you can use this to make electricity. So this is a carbon-free uh, form and really this is just a kettle the same as you would use coal you use the I'd get rid of the uranium. <laughs> <laughs> it's not in my pockets um, so we would use um, uranium to warm up the water boil the water run the turbine get the generator and send those electrons into your house to produce that slightly nervous looking uh, flashing light outside your house so that's what we would want to use it for but here's the problem all those fission products encompass the periodic table. All the elements here that are highlighted with the different colors are formed during the fission process or during bombardment of the casing of the nuclear fuel during the reaction. So what we end up with is this phenomenally complex range of metals to a synthetic chemist, an inorganic chemist like me who's interested in metals. This is an exciting smorgasbord of reagents, <laughs> but it's the right mess to be honest. Right. And these are interesting, particularly these ones that I've highlighted. These are man-made elements. So uranium is the heaviest naturally occurring element. And beyond this, in the process of nuclear fission, we form these man-made, really radioactive, really nasty neighbors that are difficult to understand. Uh, so before you have it, you might recognize the gentleman second from the left here. Before you burn up your uranium oxide fuel pellets, it's pretty safe and you can admire your shiny new fuel. But afterwards, you might recognize this gentleman here too. It's not so much fun to handle. Right. And uh, current thinking in many areas of the world is that we should bury this. Now, as a chemist, I would beg people not to do this. This is a really, really bad idea as far as I'm concerned. You might recognize this little picture as well. <laughs> You can just imagine how storing the nuclear waste underground for a long time could lead to things leaking out into that nice blue area you can see further on. Right. So what the chemists are trying to do at the moment is try to separate out this mixture of elements. And particularly, we're interested in sorting out the top row of the F elements from the bottom row of the F elements. So these are the footnotes that I showed you at the beginning. And now we have this pink mixture and this purple mixture that we need to separate out. And the reason we separate them is because once they're separated out, we can deal with them. And this is called partitioning to separate them. Transmutation is to take the really nasties and pacify them. Right. And this is the reason that we would do this, because we can monitor what happens to the radiotoxicity, the radioactivity of these things as we store them. So with no separation, you can see the time that you would need to store your material before it gets to the natural uranium radiotoxicity, back to now normal background levels, is a million years. That's uh, the sort of number that you put your little finger in your mouth corner for. <laughs> radiotoxicity um, 
you can see this is also a logarithmic scale, so these are big numbers we're worried about. With separation and partitioning and transmutation, we get to a much more sensible number. So these are two time scales that I put on the chart. The longest one, the oldest surviving civilization, you can see doesn't come anywhere near to what, how, what we could trust ourselves to look after the waste for. However, you might recognize this rather beautiful building up on the left here. If you uh, walk further into town later today, Oh, you won't have time. I'm sorry, I forgot about that. Um, so uh, for a few hundred years, we can imagine storing stuff. We can build buildings that last that long. So I would be a lot more confident about our ability to deal with radioactive waste on that sort of time scale and to look after our future. Right. The bankers in the audience may have also noticed this exciting area in this smorgasbord I showed you. These metals here, ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, silver, these are rare and extremely valuable metals. Um, and of course, this is the alchemist's dream, right? To make new elements. So if you could convert uranium into gold, who, who wouldn't want to do that, right? Now, unfortunately, you can only actually make gold in certain types of reactor. So we're not going to make those in the standard ones, but you could tune it if you were good. And in fact, we do make some metals that are extremely important in industrial catalysis for making pharmaceuticals and important things. And you only have to store them a few years before they cool down to normal temperatures. So these are valuable and interesting reasons that, that we could persuade the government that we should still be separating out these things. So how do we separate them? Uh, physically, to an engineer, to a physicist, and if I dare say this, they look almost the same. Right, all of these, lanthanum, uranium, plutonium, americium, they all look about the same. Very difficult to work out. But to a chemist, of course, we have these orbitals full of electrons. We have bonds. Chemical bonding is the way we want to use to sort out the way these things go. And of course, there are so many of these orbitals. If we can design molecular compounds, make organic fragments that can trap these things, and help us understand the bonding, we can start to selectively pick out, partition these metals that we want to do. So we take them as salts and we put an organic framework around them. We call this a ligand. You might have come across that term in biology. We put the organic framework around them and we can selectively pick these out. Right? And then we can also choose to design the organic molecular framework to start to control further reactivity and explore further and maybe discover something interesting. And we can look at metal oxide salts and choose the, the, way, the shape that we make these things in. So here's how the chemists are now treating this nuclear waste. And this is what we currently do and what we would like to do a lot better. So we take uranium or we take the... Um, spent fuel, and we dissolve it up in nitric acid, and that gives us this beaker with an aqueous solution, a water solution, of the uranium oxide salts in nitric acid. So these are nitrate salts. And we have the uranium mixed up with the fission products. And we add an organic to this. So this is a bit like making vinaigrette, but I wouldn't drink this. Um, <laughs> and uh, give it a shake. Try not to make an emulsion, because that's a terrible mess. And this is where we start to add these ligands, these molecular compounds, to complex out and pick out just the ones we want and leave the other stuff behind. And then we can transfer just the organic, the top half of our solution that floats, into another beaker, another vessel. And then we mix it all up again, strip out what we want. Right? And this, if we do this right and we choose the right organic shape, those Pac-Man, those red Pac-Man shapes that I've showed up there, bound around uranium, this is what then allows us to selectively take out and deal with each element in turn. And we can recycle the uranium and reburn it in the next generation of reactors, or we could just do something sensible with it, um, although that does get rid of it, of course. And then we can destroy the really radioactive nasties as well. So the reason uh, there's no... Um, um, I specifically chose to draw a Pac-Man shape here because in the lab we're not as intelligent as we look. We call our ligands Pac-Man. Right? This is uh, it's just fun, really. But um, this is the actual molecular <laughs> picture on the right-hand side here of what the organic framework looks like. And this was designed by my collaborator. And it's a carbon-hydrogen network with nitrogen atoms in the correct places that when it binds to a uranium atom in solution, so we can put this in an organic solution, and it wraps around it and it forms this Pac-Man shape. So it, uh, it, it nicely complexes and it forms this beautifully symmetric structure around it. And we can make this for every single metal uh, in that whole f block series, uh, including the really radioactive ones, and we can look at the subtle differences in them and learn a lot more about the bonding in them. 
And something we've done much more recently than that is to take the, uh, you see, I showed you the aqueous phase of the ura uranium oxo salts that were dissolved up. If we take too many equivalents of these that would normally fit into Pac-Man, we've just recently discovered that we make this dimeric compound. This was really exciting for us. No one has ever seen a uh, uranium form a dimer like this with such a short distance between the two uraniums, which makes us wonder if they're interacting. And also, the, the most exciting part probably is that one of the oxo groups, the little red atoms, has migrated. It's moved into a different position that people predicted would never be possible for uranium oxide. So what this does is it starts to make us think about what happens when the oxos uh, aggregate or what happens to their behavior in nuclear waste. Because the thing I didn't point out, the little tiny dots I drew on the bottom of that beaker there, those are salts that form, um, that interact uh, with oxo groups that no one really understands yet. And they mess up the process of separation by precipitating out. So hopefully this molecule will tell us more about that. And then here's another molecule that we've been working on recently that I'm particularly excited by. If we start to strip back the structure and we start to use different organic bits, this is a molecule that leaves uranium really nearly naked, which is probably about as exciting as it gets for a uranium <laughs> chemist. Um, and we can start to do reactions with molecules that people don't normally look at for these things. So this is carbon monoxide, which has an incredibly strong bond between the carbon and the oxygen. And we use, millions of, we use this to make millions of tons of chemicals in industry every year. And when we add the, uh, this to the naked uranium, it picks up at room temperature and pressure and selectively couples these and makes a new carbon-carbon bond, which is fundamentally very important, and the beginning of new pharmaceuticals, new drugs, new molecules like this. And this is incredibly facile reaction compared to what happens in industry, high temperatures and high pressures. And then we can also look at carbon dioxide. So here is uh, the molecule that Joseph Black discovered. Uh, linear, famously inert, famously unreactive, and a big problem. And when we add this to the naked uranium, uh, nothing happens according to my clicker. We make this another dimeric compound. Two uraniums come together, and they rip out one of the oxygen atoms from carbon dioxide. And you can see it between the two uraniums there. And then other carbon dioxide ligand, uh, molecules have inserted in between the organic frameworks. So we get this... Uh, deoxygenation of carbon dioxide. And what we're trying to do now is, of course, convert these into catalytic reactions so we can take them further and make other stuff. But um, it's still a lot of fun. Um, so I'll finish by showing you this kit that I found on the internet. If you, uh, if you fancy um, doing some of your own um, um, synthesis of this sort, if you'd like to make your own gold, for example, you just need to buy one of these and pop out the little pieces of plastic and glue them together and Bob's your uncle. Uh, that's really all I have to show you. Thanks very much.